Welcome to Brain and a Vat. Uh, today we have a very special episode. Those of you who've been tuning in for a while will know that we start every episode off by talking about a, a thought experiment. And today we have one of the world experts on thought experiments speaking to us, uh, Roy Sorensen from the University of Austin, Texas. Uh, Roy, would you like to start with an experiment? I sure would. This is uh, from Anthony Quinton. It's called uh, The Two Space Myth. So uh, the background is the, we have this kind of subtle Immanuel Kant business of uh, the nature of space. And Kant thought uh, space is unified. So from point, you can always go from point A to point B, right? Everything's connected up. That's the basic principle, which seems very plausible. I think that's how it's all rigged up, uh, that, that you have to, you are forced to conceive the space this way. All right, that's the background. And then Anthony Quinton comes in a couple of centuries later with the following, uh, the following tale. He says, well, suppose um, you, you're, uh, you go to sleep for 12 hours, and uh, then when you wake up, you, maybe it's in England. Um, and then when you wake up, uh, it's in um, a, a kind of a fishing village. And there's a, a woman, and you somehow recognize this woman to be your wife. And she says, go fish. You know, it's a tropical fishing village. So you get, you go down into your canoe and you somehow know what to do with the, 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 the fishing. And you spend a long 12 hour, you know, day doing your fish and you bring back the fish and you, your wife is happy and you go to sleep again and then you you awake back in England and maybe you're an accountant you know, uh, and you do your normal clerical things and you'll have a long hard day being uh, and, and so uh, then you, you're done in 12 hours again right and it keeps on going back now uh, these each of uh, these uh, two streams of experience, are equally coherent. So it isn't like a, one of these crazy dreams. These are dreams that kind of make sense. Each one, well, each, well we don't know, this is the, the question, which one is the dream, you might wonder, is, or does either one have to be a dream? So, the, so one, there are different interpretations of what could be going on here. One is perhaps you really are uh, in England uh, and you just have unusually coherent dreams for 12 hours. Uh, Another hypothesis is that you're really from this uh, fishing village and that you're just having very coherent dreams of uh, accounting in England. <laughs> uh, and uh, so there, there's one that's real and there another one that's unreal. Or maybe they're both dreams. That's another possibility. Uh, and then the other one is, and here we're just raising it as a possibility, is that they are uh, equally real. There, it's a tie, right? And what all that uh, Quinton wants to do is say, this is just a possibility. And then you become curious about, like, I'd like to go to the to this village. And so you, maybe you try to book a, uh, you know, a, a ship or something that will take you to the village and you start to do your research, but you cannot find any evidence of such a place. Similarly, when you're in your canoe, you say, well, maybe I'll canoe off to England or wherever, you know, and you try to work it out how I could go back and, you know, but there doesn't seem to be any way to do this. Okay. And so uh, you think, well, maybe it's a, there's some sort of contingent limitation, or maybe there's just, I mean, living in two, two distinct spaces. So the reason I can't go from one to the other is simply because there is no unified space. The whole point of that thought experiment is merely to show that it's a possibility. He's not trying to say you should believe this. He's saying, I haven't, I have not contradicted myself in spinning out this tale. But if Immanuel Kant is correct, I did. Uh, since I did not, there's something wrong with Kant's view that space is necessarily unified. I remember as an undergraduate being very happy with that one because I found uh, Kant's critique of pure reason very difficult to understand. And I, under, I did understand this thought experiment and I thought it gave a pretty good reason to doubt whether it's necessarily unified. So as a science fiction writer, the first thing I think of when I hear that, that thought experiment is what a cool story. You know, I want to write this as a story. And I, I'm pretty sure there are movies with this premise. Um, I, I, I vaguely recall a movie where there's an actor who goes to sleep at night and he lives another life. And now he's not sure which is the real one um, after a while, after a few backwards and forwards. Um, someone who is not a philosopher who listens to this might say, well, is that all it is? 
is what philosophers is what philosophers are doing all the time, just telling stories. You know, Mark and I, every episode we start with a thought experiment. And the question is, are those thought experiments important? Do they matter? And I guess the the first hint that it does matter is that it has an implication. And the implication that's meant to be drawn from the thought experiment is that a certain claim is false. And the claim is that space is unified. Um, But someone who's not familiar with this way of thinking might still say, hold on, how can you tell me something real about the world that space is not unified or that it is false that space is unified by just telling me a story? How can that be? So the way that Kant, the, Kant was presenting it, that it's necessarily unified. So it's not just accidental. So then that does make a uh, storytelling um, relevant uh, because you can show, well, if it were necessarily the case, then you shouldn't be able to consistently tell the story, right? Uh, now it may, so and that would suggest, well, maybe it's really not up for the metaphysician to figure out whether the space is unified. Maybe what I need to do is some physics. Right? And then, uh, so that would be a, a relevant kind of allocation of resources. Say, well, I, I shouldn't try to figure this out in the armchair. I, I really do need a contribution by physicists. And they generally are very happy about that result. They're kind of a, an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial group and they like to, they're interested in philosophical questions and they want more of them and take over more of the space. And so they would they would bring on the thought experiments. They're generally enthusiastic this way. Um, so, but those are ones in, where you're kind of debunking in a necessity, uh, but you have other things you might, you know, want to debunk, um, uh, you know, the, the mere possibility of things. So the thought experiments are generally focusing on what's possible and what's necessary. And they try, they try to uh, refute one of those two. And then that'll be relevant because there are many things such as definitions and theories that have implications about what is necessary and what is possible. Indeed, most of how we speak is uh, you know, redolent with implications about possibility. Um, and so the thought experiments are in general going to be relevant to quite a bit of quite a bit of stuff. Um, they're very, they're kind of fast food for thought. Uh, so you, you should not waste a lot of energy on exploring some hypotheses with an experiment, given you can do a thought experiment. Uh, and most of these physicists themselves will, will agree there. Um, other people such as uh, biologists are more suspicious of uh, thought experiments. They have them, but there isn't the same enthusiasm as you get from physicists. I like this idea of a division of labor. So, you know, the philosopher can sit in the armchair and can can think about, you know, this imagined world, and it has repercussions for those that are in the hard sciences. So there's going to be a point where we say, well, really, there's some empirical investigation that needs to happen. But we've delineated what those problems are for you. So we've managed to kind of create some problems for the scientists to solve. Um, and I think that strikes me as very useful. I, I wonder about you know, how, how much good work can be done with thought experiments. So, you know, as I say, we, they're integral to our show. Um, and I think they're a very useful way of testing intuitions. But some thought experiments strike me as so fantastical that we don't have ordinary intuitions in those cases. So I'll tell you one of the most famous thought experiments. Um, so um, Judith Jarvis Thompson has this violinist case, um, which we've discussed in an episode on abortion. And she has a second case, which is sort of less explored. And the second case is as follows. She says, imagine that the way that human beings um, are brought into the world is that they float around like spores. And if they land on your carpet, they will grow into babies. And so if you don't want to have a baby, what you need to do is you need to keep your windows closed. Um, But people get hot and bothered inside their house with their windows closed at the time. Um, So what they do is they say, we want to keep the windows open, but we need some kind of protective barrier like a mesh. Okay, But the mesh isn't 100% uh, viable. So you put the mesh up and, you know, 99% of the time it stops the baby spores from inseminating your carpet, but 1% of the time they get through. 
and she <laughs> says is it okay to take out the hoover and you know hoover up that baby growing up on your carpet and the idea is she wants you to say yes it is and it's meant to be a parallel case for someone who let's say has protected sex but the condom breaks and you know they should be entitled to get an abortion now my concern about the case is that it's so out of our reality to think about you know spores flying around and growing on carpets that we don't even think of that thing as a human being uh, and so we don't see a problem in that world with hoovering it up um, and this is my concern that the intuitions that we create in, in these sort of um, thought experiment cases don't always transfer well into reality yeah, uh, I think there's uh, other philosophers besides yourself who got, are concerned about that. So some of them are, there's certainly a decided preference for uh, these scenarios that are uh, kind of realistic possibilities. Uh, and even better if it was actual, that's, that's primary. So uh, if you can show that it actually occurred, there have been some thought experiments that, that has that it, uh, Colin Radford had, which actually trans, he just followed the script that he laid out uh, very well. Um, so that they kind of, you know, that's why the experiments are best. They say, well, that gives you what's actual. And so maybe you could turn your thought experiment into something actual. That would be really great. Then others say, well, I'm not going to be in that, but at least it'd be kind of a near possibility. And then there's, uh, and then we will exclude the far out possibilities. Yeah. Uh, but others say, well, you sort of bring it on in general, right? That I think we're just being, uh, okay. And then perhaps the, uh, the moderate view is, well, it'll kind of depend on the field. And um, maybe when you're doing metaphysics, you, you know, there's, you can consider all possibilities. So there's a whole, any kind of possibility counts. Then for, um, this is maybe for engineering or something, where thought experiments are still important. I don't want to consider uh, uh, worlds in which the laws of physics don't hold. Uh, that's a poor, uh, a poor way of doing engineering. Um, and uh, so I will just sort of adjust uh, the domain of discourse, the, the stuff you're talking about. What is the range of possibilities we're talking about? And it's an interesting question about like, how far does like morality go? Some of it's sensitive. I think you're you're raising some kind of concern. Well, maybe we're just not that good at it. Uh, when it, you you get something that's really out of a, a human scale, it certainly does. When you are doing physics, one of the things that is remarkable is uh, our poor performance at large scales. Uh, astronomy. Uh, it's one of the examples incidentally where uh, G. E. Moore seems to concede that common sense is mistaken um, about the distances to the stars. That's the only concession I can find <laughs> that he thinks, well, yeah, it looks like uh, common sense, like just blown away wrong about how far away those things are. Um, so, uh, or very small things. Uh, I think it's, it's much worse on the very small things. Uh, uh, quantum mechanics and the theory of relativity are both demanding. So something I'm curious about is you mentioned near and distant possibility. Um, now philosophers have, have all sorts of ways of talking about wh what possibility is. Um, you mentioned one dimension, which is, um, is it nomologically possible? In other words, do the laws of nature as they are now pertain in that possible world? Um, but I'm, I'm quite curious about what philosophers mean when we talk about near and distant possibility. I know that some philosophers have talked about possible worlds um, and near and distant possible worlds. Can you speak a bit more about what possibility is and how we grade it in terms of its nearness or, or, or distance? Yeah, so that, that's, uh, that's modal metaphysics and it's, uh, it's, it's pretty fascinating. There's a lot of controversy. Um, when um, it was, I was under the spell of David Lewis for a while uh, and David Lewis thought that these are alternative possible worlds are just as as concrete as our world. Uh, so I mean, here's how he proved incidentally that there are other possible worlds. He says, "Well, uh, there's the actual world, you know, uh, and uh, there's one." And then he thought, "Well, 
it, it doesn't matter how many I have after that. So I, I'm free to postulate many more to explain how uh, counterfactual uh, statements work. You know, what would have happened had I uh, released this, you know, and let it, you know, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't just stay where it is. It would, it would, it would fall to the ground, but I'm not actually going to do it. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, that didn't shake your confidence. So Lewis said, what happens is that you can figure out that that one's true because what you do is you, you go to the nearest possible world, nearest, he means, but at first he means by similarity. I kind of, which one kind of pretty well could pass as this world were it not for this little difference. We make a little, little bit of a change where I actually do release it. Uh, what would happen? Um, in the, what does happen in the other possible world? And then somehow I can I know what's going on in these other possible worlds. And so I think, well, yeah. In the, in the nearest possible world, the piece of paper winds up on the ground. And that's why it's true that if I were to have released the piece of paper, it would have dropped to the ground. Uh, now, there are other possible worlds, he says, more distant than ours, has more dissimilarity, in which the, the piece of paper just stays where it is. Um, and uh, somehow we do, we, we are able to kind of rank them. We can make mistakes, uh, but we are pretty good at it. Um, and so uh, he gives us this kind of uh, a knowledge of other possible worlds which other people find a little mysterious because I don't, I can't travel to another possible world. So another possible world isn't like another earth, a, a kind of a twin earth that I could go to or I could travel to. Uh, they are spatially, um, there, there's no, there, there's no, there's, they're spatially isolated. They're causally isolated. So, you know, so he's got this picture of, there's a, like a, there's a whole bunch of like, like island universes as it were. Uh, but he doesn't really have the feature that some physicists, they think there may be island universes, but they think that, well, you could in principle travel from one island to another. That doesn't, that doesn't occur for Lewis. You're, they're all self-contained and there's no moving around. And he has, then you can start asking other questions. You know, I'm not sure how many more questions you want to ask, but you, do, I, do I exist only in this possible world or maybe I get to exist in, in another possible world? Uh, so uh, some people think you, that uh, they're in more than one possible world. Lewis doesn't think so. He thinks that what's going on in the other possible world, it isn't really me who uh, holds up the piece of paper. It's a kind of a doppelganger. It's just close enough, my current counterpart. The counterpart, and it releases the counterpart of this piece of paper, and that's what we mean. Um, other people think that that's untrue to our emotions. Um, so Kripke, Saul Kripke uh, maintained, well, you can't account for why I'm relieved at a near miss. So I nearly get hit by a bus. And the emotion I feel is, whoa, you know, uh, that was really good for me that I did not get hit by the bus. You don't think, wow, that was really good for my doppelganger. <laughs> that he didn't get <laughs> so anyway so that's so there's a kind of fancy metaphysics and he's he's very good about uh calculating these things out under this hypothesis yeah so i think that uh it's these are um it's in, you can see some of the uh, the appeal of going to science fiction uh you're saying well actually with science fiction i start putting myself under some constraints then it isn't like anything goes with science fiction i get you know it depends on the genre but for some of the genre, it's just very distracting if they just start to uh, change the wrong thing, or if they just have a kind of a, uh, a some sort of make believe fix it sort of thing uh, that uh, you know, you know, not everybody likes like the Star Trek things and warp speed and stuff. What the? <laughs> not as interesting, you know, for them. Uh, so good. Just, a good example is um, in Star Trek is Q, the character Q. Um, so in Star Trek, everyone is limited by sort of uh, tangible um, material limitations. Every creature has its limitations. But Q is this omnipotent, omniscient being. Um, and it just doesn't seem to gel with the rest of the Star Trek canon. Um, it's more fantasy than sci-fi. And there's yeah. this sudden blending of two types of possibility. Um, so most of sci-fi is, most of Star Trek rather, is nomological possibility. But as soon as Q comes in, then you've got some other kind of possibility going on there, some more kind of divine possibility. 
Yeah, at, at least to some some criticisms and also some failures, I think, of fictions. So there's uh, 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 so Tamara uh, Gendler introduced the term uh, imaginative resistance. So I just can't go along with it. And possibly that was going on with the vacuuming business. You're thinking, well, that's just so far fetched. I just kind of can't really continue on. Um, it's an interesting, it's a kind of interesting opposition, um, an interesting way something, I think a thought experiment might fail. Um, um, so, you know, we're, uh, so we, it seems to be pretty frequent with morality. So if you start to tell tales in which you, you're, you're it's where it's admirable. We we don't we're really slow to accept that our moral that our moral views could be mistaken. Uh, that it oh it turns out you know that, that it's okay to uh, uh, you know, torture little babies for the fun of it or something like that. You know oh yeah so you know we just sort of I'm not, <laughs> I'm just not going along with that. Uh, it's curious why we don't want to do that, but uh, but you might think it's just too far out, you know. Uh, so I wonder if the way that you structure a thought experiment can be used to manipulate an outcome. So one of the favorite thought experiments is Nozick's experience machine, right? So it's often told, you know, to first year students, um, you know, the, the idea is, uh, if you could enter this experience machine where you can have all these, you know, delightful experiences, um, you know, where you'll have this sort of unending uh, pleasure, you know, would you step out of this reality to be permanently put in that machine? And people don't put their hands up, very few put their hands up. And the idea is that because people care about doing actual things in the world, so the intuition we're supposed to kind of, you know, derive from this response. But I wonder if you structure the experiment differently, which is this, which is if you say to the students, all of your life right now, all of the friends that you've made, the family that you have, the projects you're involved in, none of it is real. It is all part of a very elaborate experience machine. But don't worry, um, we can pull you out of it uh, and you can confront reality. How many of you will step forward and end your current lives and step into reality? And I would think you'd have a similarly small number of hands. Um, and that makes me think that the way that you tell these tales can gerrymander a result. Yeah, um, Bernard Williams thought that this was a big problem with personal identity thought experiments. These are experiments where you're trying to figure out whether you survive some process. So in Star Trek, you tell the story in such a way that people can engage in teletransportation. Uh, it's a little uh, vague as to what's happening, but it looks like what happens is that the, you're disintegrated at one point, they copy down what's important about you, and then they assemble you at some distant place from the indigenous material over there. So it looks like part of, I never doubted it incidentally before I went to a philosophy class. I always took that to be correct until um, people raised, well, how could, you know, how could you survive such a drastic uh, process? Uh, why isn't it the case? Here's the alternative that they're simply copying you and then making a duplicate at some other locale. Um, and then they, they would press you further, you know, and they would just say, uh, you know, suppose that we introduce this technology and this is the way that we can, uh, can, can travel from, from Texas to South Africa, you know, <laughs> this is the new way <laughs> and so it's faster. We just, just you know, and then they, they, they have you imagine, I think Derek Parfit has you imagine you get into the boost and then there's a, You've been doing this for a while, but then the, there's a little light goes on, you know, a little warning light. And what you had, what was going on? He said, well, the, the assembly process went fine, you know, so there. But the disintegration process is a little snafu. Could you just press the yellow button and then we'll just complete the, you know, and you're there trying to be cooperative travelers. So I'm like, you know, and then they, well, well, you know, and then you think, well, here, okay, look, you're not, it looks like you're not going to press that button. What is, well, you could either press this button or you can, or you can have the other person disintegrated. They haven't gotten out of the, the booth yet, see? So, <laughs> that's the only way out of the booth. You tend to just, uh, and never travel in that manner again, that it, it was actually covert suicide. Anyway, by telling, uh, so Bernard Williams has other kinds. So that, I never, after that, I have that's it, actually been a problem with me watching Star Trek. <laughs> I always have a little hiccup when they use the teletransporter. Teletransport, I think what happened was that, it might even be true that in the story you do make it, it's just, but it's by fiction you make it. And I just, you want to have like a good plot 
And if I were to be more realistic, I would kind of ruin the plot uh, by having too many Kirks, and, you know, okay. So maybe, but it does, it's, it's distracting. Uh, Bernard Williams would just take us one thought experiment and he would frame it in a certain way in which um, you are surviving in the, you can, he could just tell the story in such a way <laughs> that he can elicit the intuition that you survived and then take the same scenario, just frame it differently and it'll, it'll encourage the other possibility. And you can see that was going on a little, he didn't do the Star Trek thing, but you can see similarly, you can, you can start to tell the story. So people say, yeah, of course I make this, you know, I make it. Um, and then you, tell, you can tell another way in the way I just did. We say, holy moly, this is covert suicide. Uh, and then people won't do it and they'll act on it. You know, they'll, uh, they, they won't take the machine. I'd rather have jet lag, you know. Uh, um, and it, it, it redounds to like their expectations about an afterlife, for instance. They, they, they go, well, maybe I, the resurrection won't do me much good. I mean, so if all my bits and bobs are, are collected together again, well, what makes it me? Uh, and they get concerned about their prospects of an afterlife. And maybe they, if I'm gonna have an afterlife, it's gotta be in some other manner other than a, a resurrection, uh, which is gonna be uh, uh, some tension with the Christianity. They'll have to be have like more of a Cartesian view that maybe I'm a, all along an immaterial being. And uh, that's how I make it. So not that I need my body anymore. But now this is very worrying, right? Because if the whole of our channel, our YouTube channel is about thought experiments, and if every thought experiment can be told another way to elicit the opposite intuition, then are they valuable? Yeah, that would be, so that is one uh, basis of skepticism about thought experiments. There are, there are several. Uh, so uh, the people who are, I mean, it's been pressed uh, strong instantly by uh, W.B. Quine, who just will not engage in these thought experiments. He thought that was going on. He had a somewhat different idea. His idea was that it's just, a lot of these are just sort of indeterminate. Uh, situations. And what happens is um, there's nothing compelling as to what is the proper solution. Uh, it's just vague. Uh, and through, so through uh, the magnetism of the speaker, they can make it seem like there is an answer. Uh, uh, you can, uh, I had a, a colleague who was very good and he would do it in law cases. It's like he, he liked, uh, he would just tell if from what he, he would just not tell both sides of the story, basically, because the lawyers are, they're very good at uh, constructing a good case. And so, so he just sort of, and he would like get one class, one section of the class and they, everybody would be, yeah, of course, you know, this is what the, the compensation should be for this case. You know? uh, and then you just, the next section would come in and everybody, of course, you know, and, then, and he would then you know, bring them together. And then, uh, so, uh, so that was the theory in which what happens is what you, the, what the judge, the judge comes in or the jury comes in and it doesn't really matter what they're going to do. It's just an indeterminate case. It's just that it's important that they have a resolution. Uh, uh, now they have to hold their hand over their heart and say, that's what they believe. You know, if you're a judge, it doesn't stop there. You got to start, then give reasons for it. So th there was an EU case in which, uh, whether Jaffa cakes or cakes or, or biscuits or, you know, or American cookies, big tax difference, you know, and, uh, it was, it was comical because you have, you know, the panel of judges, they had to give a, a verdict and they had to give like reasons and which they did, you know, like nine or 10 reasons, you know, <laughs> learned men. <laughs> anyway, so Quine says, well, that's sweet. It's just, you know, he, his motto was like, tell it to the judge. And what the judge will do is he put on the black robe and he'll make it seem like he's got, he knows what he's doing and he will not brook any smirks from the crowd. You know, that'll be contempt of court or something, you know, and then, and then, well, that's, that's the best you can do in these situations. And so we just sort of go along with this kind of bit of fakery, you know, the, the people who are still enthusiastic about uh, personal energy, which is almost everybody, uh, they will say, look, there'll be some of the factors that will make one framing more appropriate than another. You can, if you're patient, and it is taxing your patience, you can find uh, you can often find principal differences, not always, but you can. If you can't, then you have to acquiesce to the, skep the skeptical verdict. I mean, it does seem to be mysterious. Uh, that's why I wrote the book, incidentally, because I was kind of uncomfortable with thought experiments. Um, I, I could see many good objections to them. 
Uh, and in philosophy, you're exposed to quite a bit of criticism and quite a bit of skepticism about your controversial claims. And that's why I, I took refuge in uh, thought experiments in um, science, especially physics. I took physics, oh, people will be pretty convinced that the, the physicists are doing a good job there. And, uh, you know, there's, I do, there's, a, you know, there's some in chemistry, there's some in biology, but there's quite a bit in physics. And say, well, that's part of established practice in physics. So if you were to become this skeptic about thought experiments in philosophy, and if it turns out philosophy only differs uh, from uh, science in degree, not kind, then you would have a generalized skepticism that would penetrate into physics. Uh, but you shouldn't be uh, skeptical about these aspects of physics. Uh, you should think that they're probably reliable. And so that, that legitimizing effect would then uh, pass on to uh, philosophy, although perhaps to some lesser degree. Yeah, so I wonder if it's the same sort of dilemma that a postmodernist has when they deny that there are things that are true um, and they deny the efficacy of reason and they try and persuade you by using some sort of argument which relies on reason or they try and provide you with some kind of evidence with the assumption that it could be true. And so it's a sort of self-defeating argument. Um, I, I really like what you have to say about the law. Um, and I think this is an interesting situation that judges find themselves in which is that you have equally compelling arguments on either side and you must determine it one way or the other and it's not clear which set of principles you should use but you have to pick one of them um, and you know there's some legitimacy in the process because you have a reasoned argument even though there could have been an equally well reasoned argument that just you know evolved from some other kind of principle so if you think about um, you know whether to protect a sort, certain kind of phrase in speech, um, you know, to decide whether it's defamatory or whether it's protected, you rely on two different kinds of principles. You know, the one about protecting dignity and reputation, and the other one about freedom. And you can tell two different tales um, that lead to two different results that are both grounded in principle. Um, and and I can see this is where you know Jason sort of gets very uncomfortable about the law and thinks that you know our business is a bit of a sham. Um, because we're not engaged in the sort of thing that a, a physicist engaged in. You know, there is some actual truth of the matter when you're trying to work out the inner workings of the universe in a way that whether you're trying to work out what we ought to do in the law, you know, might really just rely on these different kinds of intuitions. And I suppose this is this question about the usefulness of thought experiments is that I wonder if they're just better in certain areas than in others. In other words, it might be a good tool to use as you say, in this philosophy of science realm, um, but might be uh, a kind of more rhetorical device uh, when we're talking about, you know, moral questions and might be an illegitimate tool on that front. Yeah, uh, but even within the sciences, uh, so I had gravitated to the physicists, but I also was, I had used bio biology ones. I found a different reaction from people uh, who were uh, mostly interested in biology. Uh, they would emphasize is that it's a heavily historical uh, science, unlike physics. Um, and they were they would accept uh, that uh, thought experiments that were were kind of uh, pretty close to reality. They were pretty suspicious. You know, they think like a little bit of a scale effect could make a big difference. For instance, uh, they point out that organisms are not viable if you start changing their size rather counterintuitively, things like, um, they had no patience for the far out ones. Uh, so that was that was my own, I didn't come there with many credentials. I didn't have no credentials as a biologist. And um, I had a much harder sell and I think I still have a lot of hard sell. Um, um, I, I, I appeal to them their own practices though. Uh, so they apply game theory, for instance, when trying to explain um, the, the ratio, what, why is it like equal numbers of males and females in populations? They, you know, game theory is very hypothetical. Uh, so what I try to do is say, well, your own practices are, are legitimating uh, this. And I mean, they, they, they think that's relevant, but they're much more suspicious. So you don't have to go outside of science for this. You, you know. uh, chemistry, far fewer thought experiments. Um, uh, so it's, it's a, 
you all, this may be wonder Nate's sort of genre specific phenomenon that's a maxing of physics it develops in such a way that you know Galileo who loved thought experiments and sort of establishes this now the other point you made it's something intriguing and so the, the gradualists actually uh, I, I I completely think you're correct about the judges incidentally that I think they are uh, they do a real service they have to be decisive so they are under a handicap though uh, in that they cannot say I don't know on the crucial question. Other people can say, the lawyers can say, you know, I, don't know, I can just, I'm arguing the case, but I, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I could have argued the other side, you know, so, um, I'm, that's my role. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not there to appraise the argument. It's, it's the judges and the jurors that appraise the argument. I just, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm advocating as part of this process. Okay, so the judge is in a peculiar position uh, not a normal position, not a common sensical position, because the normal thing is that I, I'm able to shrug my shoulders and say, I don't know. The poor judge can't do this. And, and there's even further constraint. They have to do it solemnly. They have to give reasons. Uh, so there's a kind of phoniness kind of fear about it. And so you then you start looking, well, maybe, maybe I'm not a phony. Maybe the fact that I, I declare it makes it so or something which doesn't seem to give you that much basis though. <laughs> Why did you bother with the reasons then? <laughs> uh, so, but you're still attracted. Well, maybe the fact that I just, I just get to declare it and that makes it so, and that's like, that exhausts the whole problem. You know, I think it's a bit of a stretch. I think it's a real predicament for a judge. And I'm very, I wouldn't be able to do any better. So I would be up there. I'd put, I'd put my robe on and I would be scolding people for smirking, you know, and, and but I really, I got to make, I get, my role is to, it's like an umpire or something. I gotta make the call, you know? Okay, so then you say, well, that seems to be a crippling diff difference, you know, with, uh, with uh, science. So you might just acquiesce to it, but you might also have to think, well, actually in science, they also have their judges. <laughs> so there's certainly a lot of artificiality on priority judgments. Who discovered this or who discovered that? Historians find it risible that you say that these very close competitors, one person knew it before the other, or, you know, it's just, or it could be just a difference of hours, you know. It's irrational to give all the prestige to the discoverer in this way. Uh, um, so when we think about the way thought experiments work, the person who presents the thought experiment gives a scenario, and then he asks us what our intuition in that scenario is. And something that someone who's skeptical about thought experiments might say is that why do our intuitions matter? Aren't there problems with our intuitions? So in, in our most recent episode, we had Sean Stanley on, and he's an, a moral anti-realist. He thinks that there aren't moral facts. There aren't moral properties. Um, and that there's never re moral reasons for action. Um, he's not saying everything is immoral. He's not saying everything is moral. He's just saying morality doesn't come into it. It doesn't, it doesn't exist. Um, there's no foundation for morality. And that's highly counterintuitive. So he thinks that our, all these thought experiments that we have, like the one that Mark described earlier, all these thought exper experiments that we have that pertain to morality, they're eliciting these intuitions from us, which actually don't tell us anything about the world. They tell us something about our beliefs, but they don't tell us anything about the world. So what do you say to someone who says intuitions just don't matter? They don't give us any useful information about reality. Well, I think that um, that is an interesting challenge that is, uh, is at most at home in morality. Um, in mathematics, people, uh, there doesn't, doesn't seem to be this independent physical thing I'm using either, but there's a lot of consensus uh, on, on those. Um, so um, the general story people give, so when I wrote my book, I, I, I presented it as an evolutionary epistemology. So I did want to agree on some of the criticisms on using intuitions. Um, and what I had in mind in particular was uh, intuitions as applied to quantum mechanics, and intuitions as, as applied to things that are out of scale common sense. So the, the basic story was like, well, we'd be pretty good within this um, hunter-gatherer kind of setting. Our, psycho our cognitive architecture would be pretty reliable for those sort of things. And then it should uh, fail 
at scales, uh, screen scale, something I'm familiar. Um, that's a com incomplete story. It's, I'm not, uh, but I'm trying to, I was mostly trying to get the physics to work <laughs> and, and, and not have the thought experiments invade the wrong way. I should mention though, I was embarrassed in several ways. So I do think that uh, there's unexpectedly good performance often uh, by thought experiments in physics. Uh, I think uh, Einstein's theories. So your intuitions do get tutored and they develop beyond hunter-gatherer. Uh, we underestimate how much uh, theory influence uh, Ernst Mach, who uh, was studied by uh, Einstein, emphasized how much you start to soak up from your theory. And your you you know it is remarkable when you're reading Aristotle, for example, what he regards as intuitive. He thinks it's intuitive that if you had the Earth and you kind of pulled it away from the center of the universe, then it would just sort of go back, you know, <laughs> to this geometrical point. <laughs> I, that just there's no sale, you know, when you present that to to, <laughs> to, the, to the students, they just don't. What the heck? I a point in space, you know. <laughs> so there's just nothing to work with there. So they've been changed. Um, anyway, so you tell you can tell a kind of reliableist kind of account. Uh, you say, well, let's you know let's use some science to kind of pre predict when our intuitions would be good, when they would be amenable to being educated. So people, on some, not all matters, uh, so they are surprisingly hard to educate on like probability stuff, for instance, very hard. It looks like the most you can ever do is just make a, a minority of the population literate in it, and then they would have to suppress their folk theory of probability and sit on top of it. And whenever you distracted them, from applying the theory, they would revert back to this more primitive kind of thinking about probability. Um, so on, on your account, what are the best reasons for keeping thought experiments in our philosophical toolbox? Uh, because they're uh, fast food for thought, that they're, they're quick and they're uh, effective. And then you can learn about the conditions and where they're more effective and you can make them more, and then you can, there are ways that our philosophers understand how to improve on them. Uh, so if you can start to take your hypothetical scenario and uh, put it into an argument uh, that can be appraised, you know, from the standards you get from a logic class or something, that's an improvement. Um, that there, there are ways of eliciting uh, corrections from other people. Uh, so in the case of um, like the Anthony Quinton uh, thought experiment, very quickly what happened is that people would they would find flaws in the thought experiment uh and then there was an you know the, the invitation and they would people just sort of volunteer how to repair them and there's a, co a collective aspect they're provocative so you elicit conversation and there's a if it's a kind of a nice dialogue then people kind of, kind of hone in uh, there's suggestive stuff by this book called The Enigma of Reason by Hugo Mercier and Dan Sperber that I think is extra reason for thinking that thought experiments uh, pretty casually done could work pretty well. They focus on argument. Uh, and what they, they stress is they think, well, we're, we're bad if we're doing it in a solitary way, uh, reasoning. <laughs> uh, but we, our performance, uh, our performance is really from hunter-gatherer times, niche, you know, we're really social reasoners. And so we have different roles. So if you're the speaker, you just want to be persuasive. If you're the hearer, you're vigilant, right? So you need the two of them working together. Um, so the speaker will kind of say anything just to get his way. But the 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 hearer realizes this and says, and they're they're good at uh, appraising the arguments and not not you know. And so what will happen is there'll be this kind of feedback, and maybe they start changing their roles. And together uh, in a small group, um, can't be a big group, but a small group, a hunter gatherer size, <laughs> hunting, you know, gathering party, you know, five or six people or something like that, uh, that you can, uh, they perform well. Um, and he, they emphasize that this would be very good for uh, argument and they do a lot of research. But it seems to me that would, it, it would spill over pretty well to thought experiment. So Mark and I start every episode with a thought experiment for a reason, which is that 
if we were to just launch into an abstract discussion or an abstract argument about um, a concept, it would be far less accessible. And one of my favorite reasons for keeping thought experiments around is just that they're fun, that they're entertaining and engaging. And that's partly why I drifted away from philosophy as a, as a career and became a writer, because I, I, I found it more interesting to write the thought experiments than discuss the implications. Um, so so I, I, I think that, that thought experiments can be valuable to draw people into philosophy as well. Yeah, I, uh, I, I think that's, that is an important point. Um, so you have, to, um, you have to be engaging. Uh, it's not, uh, you know, um, uh, there's a motivational aspect. Uh, and I, I think there's a, you know, an academic setting tends, you know, academic philosophy, they don't really match that well often. Uh, and so they kind of, through a kind of selection process, they do work their way in even to the academics. You do use it as a kind of conversation opener. Well, I really like this idea of philosophy having a dialogue with art uh, and this idea that, you know, the two disciplines can influence each other. Um, Roy, this has been an absolutely delightful conversation. We've really loved having you on the show. And uh, thank you so much. Well, I, I loved it. Thank you very much. And I, I learned about thought experiments myself. Great. Great.